Overboost is mainly just hype. Full details next. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Australia new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. Volkswagen, Ford, Hyundai and frankly a heap of other car makers are pumping themselves up literally with the high-tech miracle of so-called overboost, at least on some models. And apparently some people do not know what this is. Mate, what's overboost? I don't know what this is. May not be a real question. The Hyundai i30N, which is an awesome hot hatch, manages to stuff a little bit of overboost down the front of its trousers before going out on a Saturday night, and also at other times, you might note. The standard torque delivery is 353 newton metres from 1450 to 4700 revs, or on overboost, you get 378 newton metres from 1750 to 4200. That is, with a sock on its, uh, whatever. That's about a 7% increase. And Volkswagen assholes managed to do this too with the Amarok 550 and 580 V6 diesel shitbox utes. Here's how monkey spanker marketers embellish the Oncock sock for the Amarok 580. The Ultimate 580 is tuned to deliver 190 kilowatts of power, surging to 200 on overboost. Note to semi-literate marketing dicks and other so-called communications professionals at agencies. The last time the word overboost was a proper noun was never. And quote, surging from 190 to 200, yes! All that way, just amazing, isn't it? A massive surge of 5%. Holy overstatement, Batman! I've never seen a company more shit scared of competition, right? You know, the three-point swastika sticker releases an X-Class with a V6, and these Volkswagen dickheads have to stretch another pig's scrotum, or is that a monkey's scrotum? I always get them confused. Anyway, they try and turn it into a three-piece carry-on luggage set every friggin' time. Dust insecurity. Anyway, overboost, right? If you see this in the brochure, it is 80% marketing wank and 20% fact, and that is being quite generous. Should you buy one of these overboosted vehicles, I strongly suggest not wasting any time looking for a button or diving into a menu system because there is nothing for you to activate. Overboost is just there. It is enabled and ready to go all the time. It's really just part of the engine management software implementation for a turbocharged engine. And what happens is the engine control computer waits for the right set of conditions to green light the whole thing. For example, in the i30N, you'd need to be inside the rev window, which is 1750 to 4200 revs. You'd need a big throttle input. The temperature might have to be in the green zone and it might only work in some gears. I don't know about that last one. There's a bunch of inputs anyway, and they're preconditions that have to be met. So when they are, the ECU gets a whole bunch of go type inputs for overboost and it opens the veins up inside the turbo and that allows a bit more exhaust flow, which in turn drives the turbo a little bit harder, you get more boost and hence the marketing wank name. And it also starts a timer when that happens and that is quite important. The turbo delivers slightly more boost and that means you get more mass flow of inlet air into the engine. The ECU increases the fuel injector flow to compensate and then more fuel gets burned per unit time, right? So this is all good. You get more torque at the crank when that happens and torque times revs equals power. Therefore, you get more power at those revs. So when Hyundai talks about the torque boost at those revs, what they're really talking about is a 7% increase in power at those corresponding revs. It's the same thing, but in the brochure, I guess, and on the website, it would be harder to quantify the power because that changes with the revs, whereas the torque does not. More heat gets produced too when you're in overboost mode and heat 
kills things like turbos and pistons inconveniently, expensively. So the timer is running to limit the duration of what would otherwise be far too risky an operation if it were open-ended in the time domain. So overboost forever equals a loud noise and then deafening silence plus some repair bill that you can't jump over problematically. You get maybe 10 or 15 seconds in overboost mode and that is of that increased output and then literally the computer calls timeout and normal programming is resumed and all of this happens automatically. So yeah, the increase is real, but it's also modest and very brief. And there's no quote, surging, Volkswagen. Overboost is probably an asset when you're overtaking a truck or getting on the gas on the way out of a turn on a racetrack, but mainly it's just hype to get you across the line. So it's really just another routine built into the foundation of all the stuff that drives a variable geometry turbo. Inside the turbo, there's nothing variable about the impeller itself, right? The spinning bit is a work of art in solid titanium alloy designed to spin at 200,000 RPM or something, which is brain bending, you know, frankly, unimaginable, at least to me. I cannot imagine spinning at 3,000 revs per second. I mean, come on. That's pretty special voodoo right there when you think about it, with apologies to Arthur C. Clarke, who would call it magic or sufficiently advanced technology. There's a ring with throttling vanes built into it inside the turbo housing controlled by a servo motor. And that allows the engineers back at R&D Central to vary the amount of exhaust that drives the turbo. And that's what a variable geometry turbo really is. So you get exhaust inlet geometry variability inside the driven part of the housing. At low engine speeds, they can open up those vanes and let in more exhaust flow and if they get that right, you virtually eliminate turbo lag, or at least you extend the non-lag envelope of engine operation, which is great. And that's why turbo lag is basically gone. And then at high speeds, right, you can close the vanes up and that will prevent overspeeding or properly overboosting the turbo. An overboost in that sense is a bad thing. It blows engines up, which is great if you're a spectator and bad if you're an owner. And then when you're in marketing wank overboost mode, the veins just open a little bit more than normal for those critical 10 to 15 seconds and the output climbs maybe 5 or 7% or whatever. And I suggest you're probably not going to feel it. The other thing about marketing type overboost is it's really just a duty cycle thing. And plenty of machines not cars typically, but plenty of other machines have duty cycle type specifications. Here's an example, okay? You might go out and buy yourself a 150 amp welder and then be somewhat gutted when you bring it home and discover that there is a 30% duty cycle at 150 amps, which means inside a 10 minute window, you can only weld at 150 amps for three minutes and the other seven minutes has to be downtime, which is rather a lot of thumb twiddling. So I guess that's kind of okay at home or in a prototyping environment where there's going to be a lot of setup and not much welding per 10 minutes. But in a production environment where time is literally money, you might want to weld continuously and therefore you might need to buy yourself a 250 amp welder if you want to access 150 amps of welding more or less without limitation. In other words, time and output generally combine to impact on the durability of machines when you get near the limit of their performance. An overboost is kind of subject to that time and durability criteria. With cars, they don't generally specify high output duty cycles because that would require actual understanding of the underlying machine by the people driving them. And nobody wants that. So all those protocols are built in and they fly under the radar. And also in practice, it's hard to operate a car anywhere near its peak powertrain output for a sustained period of time, unless you're on a dynamometer. 
Maximum power is quite hard to get to out there on the road and it is almost impossible to remain at, even on a race track. Because even on a track driving as hard as you can, there are plenty of braking points where you're off the gas and hard on the brakes or else you are feathering the throttle in a turn. So overboost is there in those cars, it's going to get increasingly common, but it's mostly just hype and it sounds good on the right kind of car, which might be enough to get you across the line. But if you really need it to get around that truck, right, in my view, you've already made a bunch of quite poor decisions about overtaking out there in the real world, at least in my view. And now, a new segment that I call Shit People Say. If you enjoy my videos, okay, I guess that's allowed. But if you hate them, Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for being part of this segment. I'm retarded dick fart. Diesel engines invented compression ignition, not Mazda. Why don't automakers use it? I don't know. I think they don't care about efficiency. Have you noticed how online conversations almost never start the same way face-to-face -face encounters do. Very few people in the real world have ever walked up to me and said, hey, retarded dick fart, would you kindly direct me to the closest house of ill repute or whatever. But on YouTube, it is an almost hourly occurrence. I love it. <laughs> also, I didn't realize diesel engines themselves invented their very own ignition technology. I thought people did that, so thank you very much for clearing that up. At the risk of interjecting a fact here, you know, the reason why compression ignition gasoline engines are not widely deployed, and yes, they would be more efficient if they were, is that it is such a technical challenge to control the combustion event across all the possible operating conditions. And Mazda, whether you like this or not, is the leader in crossing those technical hurdles with compression ignition gasoline engines currently. That's just how it is over here in the real world. This bloke is Aussie, so this means he gets stiffies over everything Japanese and most German. Don't bother listening. It's gonna be Jap. Stiffies. Double F-I-E-S. You imbecile. Despite this, you know, Toon Mag's message makes me feel quite inadequate. He's out there fantasizing apparently about me achieving stiffies, plural, and all I can manage at any point in time is <coughs> one stiffy. <coughs> but I think you'd agree, you know, a prime specimen at least. <coughs> well done, mate. I didn't even realise one could enjoy multiple stiffies. I thought that was more of a chick thing. So I will look into that. But up front, I have to say, it feels kind of like <laughs> cheating. John, you should clearly say up front that your advices are only applicable to Australia, where nothing is available other than kangaroos. Yes, another excellent point. One of my favourite things about multiculturalism, now that I think about it here in Australia, is the food, right? See, when I grew up, all we ever ate was kangaroo. Breakfast, lunch and dinner. That kangaroo and beer three times a day. That was it. Seven days a week. We didn't complain about this, right? That was just the way things were. At times, it even gave me... Uh, <laughs> A stiffy, but only one at any given time, sadly. And now, however, in the 21st century, thanks to an influx of migrants from all over the world, their traditional food and ours has mixed. It's fused, crossbred, synergized, whatever you call that. It's gestalt theory. The whole has become greater than the sum of the parts. Thank Christ, in particular, for Middle Eastern immigration. See what I did there? Because now, right, we have kangaroos, which is a fusion of the traditional doner kebab using that sort of 
mystery meat and adapted in the 21st century to the shay and staple up with which I grew. And like most proud Australians, we have kangaroos for dinner most nights. And so do most people I know. There are various bastes and marinades, dry rubs and seasonings, of course. But the real skill, right, with kangaroos, especially if you are cooking this at home for the first time, you want to know this. You've got to be able to cook the beast right through without charring the joey. Most people get that wrong. A little moderate caramelization is okay. I mean, that's a pro tip. Hashtag kangurusexpert.com.au Hashtag Australia.